All right, next on the list for today, attention deficit disorders. So you have two terms, ADD and ADHD. They're basically the same thing. One, I think ADD was the older term um, and was thought there might have been a difference between those who are distracted and there's attention deficit, deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is the more current term for the psychiatric condition. This uh, attention de deficit diseases were originally thought to be, or disorders, excuse me, were originally thought to be pediatric. But it's estimated that about 1 to 7% of adults suffer from ADHD wildly, or widely, excuse me, um, undiagnosed for a lot of people, but that's what some studies will show. That's a lot of people. If you think about, let's do an average of 3, 4% of people out there have ADHD. I mean, how many people out there are actually managing it appropriately? I think some people um, have coping mechanisms. Some adults will um, develop depressive symptoms because of it. So we'll get into some of that too. But for childhood ADHD, not all children will carry ADHD into adulthood. 30 to 70 percent of children uh, thought to carry that on. Um, it is more common in males than females, um, and that goes for both uh, children and adults. Um, again, the terms ADD, ADHD are basically interchangeable. Physiology, uh, thought to be some sort of a catecholamine imbalance in the cerebral cortex where you're having a miscommunication between dopamine and norepinephrine. Increase in dopamine transporter density, so dopamine is clearing too quickly from your synapse. And um, serotonin probably has some kind of a role, but less well understood. Clinical manifestations, poor concentration, distractibility, elevated motor activity, impulsivity, and disinhibition. Uh, feature disrupt, uh, disruptions at least two domains of daily, or features disrupt at least two domains of daily life. Correct my typo here. School, work, family, peer, relationships, stuff like that. Um, other problems, poor self-regulation, difficult with goal-directed thought or action, hyperactivity component, less overt in adults. So most adults have probably developed a coping mechanism for the hyperactivity component, whether they're fidgety or whether they you know, get active. I don't know if I sit at my desk for a long time. I like to get up and move around. I like to stay mobile if I can at work. Um, am I ADHD? I have no idea. Maybe. <laughs> Probably not. Um, but anyway, so adults will generally develop a coping mechanism where they've just learned to regulate this hyperactivity component. <laughs> and it just manifests a little bit differently in adults. Adults will channel that um, imbalance differently into their work life than a, a child would. Um, they may feel um, other things though. So like at the end of the workday, they can't unwind, they can't relax. They feel on edge even when they're trying to relax. Um, disorganization, socially and professionally, prioritization issues and learning disabilities are common with these, with uh, deficit disorders, attention deficit disorders. Treatment overview, pharmacotherapy is usually first line. Psychotherapy may be helpful in addressing and restoring some problematic behaviors, but usually not going to be all that effective at helping with the symptoms. Um, norepinephrine pathway seems to be the best at treating ADHD, and we'll talk about the drugs here in a second. Um, stimulants are the mainstay of therapy still in children and adults. Um, antidepressants are also commonly used in adults. And goal of therapy is to restore functions of daily living. So stimulants. Uh, stimulants stimulate the release of catecholamines from CNS storage sites. So what's going to happen is you get an increase in synapse concentration of norepinephrine and dopamine. Um, increased norepinephrine, dopamine, brainstem, midbrain, and frontal cor cortex. Stimulants are relatively safe at the doses we give them, and they're pretty, I'd say, you know, when you think about a stimulant, you're like, oh, it's like cocaine or something like that. Well, okay, if you, if, or methamphetamine, like if you abuse a drug, a drug like that, yeah, you're going to get a massive rush of some of these neurotransmitters. But in this case, and yeah, if you took a ton of stimulant, uh, prescription stimulant, you'd get the same effect somewhat, but um, at the doses you you prescribe this at and that people take it at, it, it's a much more gradual effect and a much more subtle effect. Um, however, it does definitely still have a high chance for abuse just because of the fact that they are very similar to um, illicit stimulants. Um, let's see. Caution, infirmer, current, current substance abusers. You always have to be have your guard up, I think, when people are, if somebody comes to you and is requesting stimulants or talking about how they think they have, blah, blah, blah. It, just make sure you, you know that you're treating somebody appropriately. It's kind of like opioids. It's the same thing. You can use a prescription monitoring program to see if people are doctor shopping for stimulants. Um, it does happen. A lot of people will seek them out for themselves, though, just because they think they have some perceived advantage to help them study or to help them with athletic performance or something like that. 
uh, more effective in children than adults and shown to improve daily living skills for both parties, but again, more effective in kids. No difference in efficacy between the agents. The agents are basically all exactly the same. So Dexedrin, Adderall, Ritalin, it's all the same thing, really. It's just slightly different formulations and um, the release mechanisms are the big, big changes here, or the big uh, difference between the different products. So we'll talk about that here in a second. Good short-term benefits. Uh, that have been studied. The long-term benefits of stimulant use are questionable. We don't really know if long-term stimulants help ADHD patients over years of use, but short-term benefit does seem to be clinically uh, prevalent. All right, let's talk about a couple different types of stimulants. Methylphenidate is Ritalin. It uh, comes as a bunch of different formulations, and this is really a hallmark with stimulants. They all come as a lot of different formulations. So um, the short-acting ones are Ritalin, which is generic, intermediate, get Ritalin SR, which is a sustained release product, and Metadate and Methylin, those are all the same thing, really. They last different amounts of time, but basically the same thing. If you think about stimulants, if you can give something that's extended release, you're even going to delay that rush of, like if you took a, a bunch, like if you took a big dose of Methylin ER, crushed it up, and, and swallowed it all at once, yeah, you'd probably get a maybe a little bit of a stimulant rush from that take it appropriately and correctly, you're probably going to see that delayed release of the drug, cause a delayed release of those hormones, uh, imbalance corrections, and it's going to have a nice sustained effect that's not going to really have a strong blunted peak. And that's going to be big for helping people not to abuse these, because if they're getting a big peak effect from it, they might be more inclined to try and abuse the medication, in my opinion. Um, long acting, uh, Ritalin long acting or Ritalin LA comes it's, is generic now. So all the Ritalin formulations are generic and relatively in, in, uh, affordable. One of the most popular drugs is Concerta. And Concerta has some generic ones. However, so Concerta has this interesting mechanism. It's called osmotic release. And that's what this drawing is here. Basically, it's this permeable shell where once you swallow it, water goes through it and it starts to dissolve it. And it's got this little hole in the end. And the compartments release at different phases. So this first phase, whoops, I'm moving my thing here. This first phase releases very quickly. Second phase, more intermediate, and the long phase takes a little bit longer to get out. So the drug releases over time that way. It's actually a pretty ingenious uh, delivery mechanism. Um, it's kind of a hallmark one for unique um, capsule delivery forms for like drug delivery. But anyway, the point is, is that uh, Concerta um, does have some generic forms, but there's some debate over whether they're truly generic because Concerta has a patent on this particular process, and no one else can do this because it's it's sort of like an inhaler, if you think about it that way. Like, it's the delivery of the drug, not the drug itself. So the drug in here is generic. It's methylphenidate, but the way it releases is different. So if you hear, oh, I'm on generic Concerta, it's like, well, not technically. So you might see people, I think some drug companies have gotten around the patents and made similar type products, but um, Concerta is still Concerta. Although a lot of people are using the generic pretty much interchangeably now. I say the generic as a question mark or in quotations. Um, Daytrana is a methylphenidate patch. So it's got a two hour delay of onset, but it's a daily patch you can take. Um, very popular for kids who might not take medications or um, adults who forget, uh, mostly used in pediatric patients. Um, and there's some other products too. All these, again, very similar. But you have lots of different ways to get this into people. You have capsules, tablets, you have patches, you have an oral suspension, this Quilovent XR. Um, this is the difference in onset of methylphenidate formulation. So we have a couple of different things here that are interesting to look at. So let's look at, oh, what is this? So the X's are Riddle and SR. You see kind of a standard dose response curve here. Um, Concerta, you see the initial peak and then sort of a delay and slow increase and then another secondary peak. And go. So what that does is it prevents a, a more substantial peak initially like some of these drugs have, but then you get a little bit of a boost later. So some patients, it's again, very popular products, so people tend to respond to it well. <clears throat> and this one is Ritalin long acting, which you can see has a big peak and tapers off very quickly though for a long-acting product. So you can see why some of these drugs might be a little bit preferred um, versus other ones just with the different peak effects that they're getting. Other stimulants, dexmethylphenidate is Focalin. 
Um, dextroamphetamine, dextrostat or dexedrine. Dex amphetamine mixed salts is uh, the word generic for Adderall. There's a couple different amphetamines that they mix together as a formulation. It's dextroamphetamine and basic amphetamine, I think, are the two they use. Um, Adderall and Adderall XR are really popular drugs, you guys probably know. They're both generic now. Adderall XR comes as a capsule. It's a really popular long-acting product. Um, List dexamphetamine or Vyvanse is a really long-acting one that's uh, another very popular drug. That's uh, brand new only. It's kind of expensive. Um, okay, so side effects. Cardiovascular, more concerning in adults than children. You can get an increased heart rate and blood pressure. Um, some people actually don't think there's any real clinical issues with this. If you had somebody who's a, a hypertensive adult, probably avoid cardio uh, or any type of cardiovascular disease in an adult patient, I'd avoid stimulants. But for kids, really no issue. It's also actually been thought that there might be a protective effect to sudden cardiac death. So if somebody has a history of um, heterogenic cardiomyopathy, maybe it would be good for like a kid to actually take a stimulant to protect them from this, interestingly enough. Not, not really fleshed out, but kind of an interesting side note there. Um, neurologic and psychiatric sleep disturbance would be the big thing. So not taking them late at night or before bedtime. A lot of people will take, uh, commonly what people might do is take a uh, long acting stimulant in the morning and in the evening they might take another small dose of regular release. But the idea is that all of it's gone by the time you go to bed. Um, does suppress appetite, which is thought to lead to growth stunting in children, potentially. Um, this is something that is caught up. So I think I can't remember if I, let me just check something here. Yeah, I talk about that on the next slide here. Uh, tick development, which is a little bit more rare. Abuse potential, of course. Um, priapism, which is a sustained unwanted erection, um, can happen in males of all ages. It's relatively rare with stimul stimulant use, but it's more common than um, like for, for example, non-stimulant using general population members. Some other things you can take as needed. Some people might just take them, you know, these are prescribed always, and you could debate the, the merits of taking it as needed or on a daily basis. But some patients might say, well, you know, I have a particularly busy, let's say you're talking about a college student and they have classes mostly on, uh, excuse me, Monday, Wednesdays, or Fridays. And so they take them on those days, and then Tuesdays and Thursdays you don't really need it as much. But then you could argue, well, you're probably doing work or homework or something. So some people just might find that they that their um, attention deficit gets overactive in certain situations and not others. And so it just depends on the person. I have I've known people who took who didn't take them during the day. Like I have no I have, <laughs> I had friends in college, one friend particularly who didn't take anything during the day but uh, they would take one in the evening to help them uh, prioritize their homework and work on their studying. So they take a, a short acting one kind of in the early afternoon and that would help them, you know, be productive throughout the evening. Otherwise they were just kind of sort of wouldn't touch their homework and wouldn't do anything, but they're good at paying attention during class and taking notes and things like that without the stimulant. So it's kind of an interesting balance there. But a lot of people, a lot of adults, you'll see them take a, an XR in the morning and then maybe they'll Take something else in the evening but again the idea is that you're you're out of stimulant by the time you need to go to bed um, drug holidays are really common for kids specifically and so a lot of times in the summers or on spring break or whenever you're going to have them stop and the idea is is that the growth retardation that can happen which is thought to be somewhat associated with appetite suppression will catch up so um, if you look at kids who are not treated with stimulants versus kids that are over time the effects will diminish so basically the child's growth will catch up so the child on a stimulant might not be as tall or as large as their peers but you know when they're i don't know let's say 10 but when they're 15 i'm just making up numbers here but you guys get the point things catch up so the child will eventually they, they, the point is there isn't thought to be long-term growth retardation the child will catch up so it's not thought to be a big deal uh withdrawal usually quite mild, especially if you're taking it as prescribed. It does depend on the formulation and the dose, of course, just like anything, um, but um, could exacerbate ADHD symptoms. So if you do a drug holiday on somebody, they might taper the kid off for a couple of days and then do a full-on holiday, but um, otherwise, uh, if they're on a low dose, you can probably just stop it altogether pretty safely for most patients.
All right, moving on from stimulants, adamoxetine or stratera is a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It's non-addictive, non-controlled, and non-stimulant. However, it does have some similar properties to our stimulant products, so I don't know. But it's not as, uh, it doesn't affect dopamine as much at all, really, and it's really just a, a norepinephrine mostly drug. It's effective, but um, clinically proven to be not quite as effective as our stimulant product. Ooh, change this. This actually just went generic recently. Generic recently. It's still expensive. It's still kind of in that phase where it's a new generic and it's pricey as well. Uh, adverse effects, fatigue, insomnia, dry mouth, headache, weight loss, GI issues, erectile dysfunction, um, and priapism. So I guess you get both sides of that coin with this medication. But uh, similar to a stimulant, not all that different. Um, it just probably less side effects that you're going to see as far as the insomnia, um, and uh, the appetite suppression probably going to be a little less than your full-on stimulant. Uh, rare, um, severe, uh, severe hematotoxicity can happen, so some monitoring or just being aware of it might be appropriate. Cardiovascular hypertension and palpitation. So this is another drug that focuses on norepinephrine, so in patients with cardiac history, probably not the best idea. Very popular alternative to stimulants, though. Um, antidepressants. So... Uh, tricyclic antidepressants inhibit, we talked about inhibiting norepinephrine and, and serotonin. Uh, Desipramine and nortriptyline are two of the drugs that have been pretty well studied in ADHD and have good response rates. They have better norepinephrine focus than other TCAs, so other TCAs might have more reuptake inhibition of serotonin. These ones tend to be more heavy on the norepinephrine side, which is likely why they're more effective. Uh, four weeks to full response. Uh, not going to be a real commonly used one, but if you have a patient who's depressed and has ADHD, this might be a good option. I guess anything on this slide would be a good option. Uh, bupropion has more stimulant properties than the TCAs. It's not sedating, so if you have somebody who might be a good candidate for antidepressive therapy plus attention deficit, Wellbutrin could be a good drug to try. Um, two weeks to response about with Wellbutrin. Um, MAOIs, probably last line therapy, just like they are for depression, that's all I'm going to say. SSRIs and SNRIs are mostly adjunct use only, and SNRIs may be more effective than our SSRIs. Just because of the norepinephrine pathway, that would logically make sense. I will throw out that any of these drugs can be combined with stimulants or stratera as well. Um, now, that'd be debatable, I think, depending on how much norepinephrine you want, but they are slightly different. So certainly with the stimulants, you could combine them. Um, I'd be careful. I don't know if a drug like bupropion, since it's a little bit more stimulating in and of itself, would be good with that, but you could certainly consider it. So these are different mechanisms and you could consider combining agents. Um, the alpha-2 agonist, guanfacine, uh, which is 10x or Intuniv, there's two different products. One's a immediate release and one is an extended release product. Um, so these are alpha agonists and they work in the central nervous system and they're thought to have some sort of a alteration on the way norepinephrine's processed. So maybe a similar roundabout pathway that's working on that norepinephrine pathway. Um, thought to be beneficial in children and adolescents with questionable use in adults. There's not a lot of studies showing that these drugs are effective in adult patients, so we don't really know. Um, but you might see them used rarely. Um, children who have aggressive behavior or significant hyperactivity might respond well to these because um, sometimes stimulants can exacerbate those types of effects. Um, adverse effect is uh, sedation. These are more sedating, so all of our other drugs are pretty activating with the exception of the tricyclic antidepressants. These ones tend to be sedating. So again, for somebody who's aggressive or very hyperactive, this could be a preferred agent. Um, clonidine is similar in, in how it works, so it's essentially acting alpha-2 agonist as well. And um, good option for an adult who has ADHD symptoms, but also has hypertension. All right, stimulant abuse, just to talk about this quickly. Stimulants are all Schedule II. Um, the prescription limitations, um, but you can do a 90-day supply in some cases. Generally with C2 medications, you can only do 30-day supply max, but with some stimulants you can do, or some um, cases you can do longer with stimulants. I think there's been tons of articles, and it's pretty common knowledge that people abuse these medications. I'd say the, the college and high school student abuse is probably rampant, but equally so in the adult workplace, I think. Um, 
including performance arts and athletics too. A lot of sp sports regulatory organizations will ban these products, uh, as like the Olympics bans them, for example. Um, the slow release of oral stimulants does not produce a high like cocaine or methamphetamine. Ones. So we talked about this already. Uh, if you again, if you ground up your Adderall and inject it, you're going to get a rush similar to like injecting cocaine or if you snorted it. Um, patients at high risk for abuse, um, I would say stick to maybe well, either add amoxetine or try tricyclic antidepressant and avoid the stimulant altogether. So the question is, and this is a great question, um, is what about patients without ADHD? So people are abusing these drugs. Is it because they have ADHD and aren't diagnosed? Um, is it because they think there's some perceived benefit and somebody who doesn't have a hormonal imbalance, are they going to get benefit from these medications? That's great questions. I've had many of them myself, which is why I put a slide on here about it. Uh, but do you have some kind of neurochemical imbalance to get positive clinical effects from stimulant? Well, yes and no. There's evidence for both directions. So yes, theoretically, um, the stimulants will make someone who does not have ADHD symptoms energetic and hyperactive. Now, does that mean that uh, they're going to get more stuff done and be more productive? Possibly, yeah. I mean, you might have just more energy to and feel like you can enhance your own task-oriented uh, mindset already. Possibly, yes. Um, so, no, many people without the disease diagnosis seem to be able to abuse the medication with successful results. So, yeah, I mean, that's the question, right? So, theoretically, you shouldn't really get a benefit from them other than just feeling hyperactive and energetic, which, again, could help you. But... Um, people abuse these. So is it because they are getting help or they, they enjoy this sensation that they're getting? I mean, I, I don't know. I think research is very difficult in this area because, you, again, you don't know if there's some sort of a diagnosis that's missing as well. That could be their thing, undiagnosed ADHD. But I'd say there's not a good answer to that question. All right, treatment. Initial history, no history of drug abuse or, or um, dependence. Stimulant, pick a formulation. If it doesn't work, switch. Uh, consider mixing long-acting with short-acting products to bridge your patient through the day. Um, and that's going to be a little bit of trial and error, but I think a good strategy to approach is like the one I've been talking about is that you know, start somebody, use a long-acting product during the day, and then if they need an additional bump through the evening, maybe give them an immediate release that they take when they get home from school or work. Um, history of abuse with second line uh, options. So this would either be for somebody who has a history of abuse or just maybe isn't responding as well to a stimulant as you want, might like. Add amoxetine or tricyclic antidepressants. Um, you can maybe throw the appropriate here too. Guanfacine for kids, clonidine. Uh, if you have an adult that's hypertensive, um, you'd want to do, uh, you'd want to avoid stimulants as well. So clonidine would be first line for those patients, which is going to be an odd subset of people, but certainly possible. Not responding, try different stimulants, um, try different stimulant combinations, try different formulations. Combine classes, so use a stimulant plus an antidepressant, um, or add, uh, I should say, obviously antidepressants are above, add Consider treating depression. So a lot of times for adults, they might have a depressive component in addition to their ADHD. So using stimulants plus the depressive treatment arm can be helpful. So that's something to consider. It's a bit complicated, I think, but not terribly. I mean, you're really focusing on stimulants for the most part and then trying some of these adjuncts if, if there's a, a really good reason to do it. But for the most part, stimulants are going to be by, by far and away the mainstay of treatment for um, ADHD.